Hey there, and good evening in my case, and welcome to Octoprint on Air number, uh, I think 47. <laughs> yeah, 47. We are, we are on 47. Yeah. I'm your host, Gina Heuske, as always, with all the B in the middle of my name there. And yeah, well, it has been a while. I'm going to talk to you uh, today about the usual stuff. Um, about all the stuff that I've been up to since the last one of these, what the next steps will be on my busy schedule, and then we'll take a quick look at the stats. Normally we then would have a Q&A segment, but there were no questions left unanswered in the backlog, so we are going to use the live chat for that, I guess. Uh, speaking of live chat, usual stuff, if you're on mobile, that is probably going to be somewhere down there, and if you're uh, on, um, on, on PC, on desktop, or whatever, then it is going to be over there, I think. Um, and obviously, if you're watching this as a recording, there is no live chat. But right now, as I am recording that, there is a live chat. Um, yeah, so what I've been up to. Uh, I mentioned it the last time. You also saw this probably on my, uh, on, my, on my Patreon update or on my GitHub sponsors update. I was on vacation. So pretty much for all of July, actually, which was not the original plan. The original plan was something like three weeks instead of the four that it became. But the thing was that by the start of week number three, I noticed that I was still utterly exhausted, that I only barely started to feel relaxed and come down from this usual really, really bad feeling about not doing anything and not being productive and taking a break and all of this. And... So I decided, okay, I'm going to tag another week on. And that was a good decision because that week really was, uh, yeah, like that the past one and a half weeks were, were really where I, where I could really relax and, and calm down and um, recharge a bit above the zero level, so to speak. And that was good. Um, yeah, in the middle of, of this vacation, so pretty much right in the middle of, of July, I spent some really, really nice uh, 10 relaxing days uh, in a little vacation home that we rented up uh, on the uh, North Sea coast. We did some hiking, including in the Warden Sea. Uh, we rented some we rented some e-bikes for most of the time and uh, also spent a lot of time in the saddle of these and and I, I think all in all we we biked something like 150 or so I don't know kilometers uh, maybe maybe a bit less than I, I actually I don't wait 50 one day and then uh, mm, 20 the other yeah I think 150 is not too far off the thing it might even have been close to 200 in seven days and uh that was a lot of fun what else um the the air was absolutely beautiful it was surprisingly cool because yeah um that was just before this huge heat wave um uh, got its hold uh, over over germany um and uh yeah we we barely made it above 20 degrees so funnily enough while we were at the sea vacationing on the sea we did not actually go into the sea apart from up to the knees uh because it was simply too cold so no swimming but that was okay uh we still had a lot of fun and we also saw some wild seals which was really really cute one of them was taking a sunbath and i got some really candid shots off of it and uh yeah uh, uh i think one of those i posted also on, on twitter and on patreon and on github sponsors so you might have seen it uh that little thing sunbathing and not giving a damn about everything going on around it and in the world and that was really a bit of something to copy maybe i don't know but yeah could learn from that okay uh, and uh, because this question came up in previous installments of Octoprint on Air, uh, I thought I would also tell you about some of the cut designs that I uh, did at the start of my vacation. I actually wanted to show you uh, some of that stuff. So um, most of that is actually bike related because if you remember, I think I mentioned it here as well, but also on social and stuff, I got myself an e-bike at the end of March and for that I needed some accessories. So uh, one of the things that I uh, designed and finalized during my first week of my vacation is this fun little dual uh, D-lock mount for, for the top tube of my bike. There is a little uh, bottle cage holder screw, uh, screw mount, uh, mount, yeah mounting screw stuff happening here and this thing gets screwed into them and then further secured with uh, 
with this very wide and very strong uh, Velcro strip. And that now holds my two D locks, one Kryptonite New York standard and yes, tested by the lock picking lawyer <laughs> and one hip lock DX. And um, both of these together with a very, very heavy chain are my security concept for this e-bike together with an insurance, of course. And now they no longer get in the way. So they sit just snug in there, nothing wiggles, nothing shaves anywhere. And uh, it's beautiful how that turned out, really. It was a bit um, annoying to get everything right and it took ages to print, but yeah, it works nicely. And should you happen to have the same locks, uh, yeah, I threw it up on printables and uh, I think including the, yeah, including the free cut file. So if push comes to shove, you can also adjust it to your own locks if you need to mount to uh, D locks to your bike frame with similar uh, layouts. And uh, the other thing that I did that you can also see a bit here already is the hip lock usually has this this clip thing here on top with, with which you're supposed to put it into your belt and I found this quite annoying so I designed a new front cover for that, a new front plate and printed it in the same neon yellow uh, uh, as as the as the lock mount, quite a, a rather simple design really, but uh, it it fits nicely, makes this thing quite the eye catcher now, and it also no longer interferes with uh, mounting it the way I'm mounting it. So yeah, that was really fun to be able to just solve these issues with uh, FreeCAD and a bit of time and fiddling around and and a 3D printer, and that is really really what I still thoroughly enjoy uh, about 3D printing, even though I do it as my job, as well. So um, that was fun. Uh, I did another thing that is not yet online anywhere, uh, which is I got myself a radar unit for my bike and uh, that also needed mounting and uh, I didn't want to mount it to the saddle post because then I cannot really use the the rack anymore for transporting stuff without it interfering with that. So instead I mounted it just below the backlight uh, that is integrated into the rack and that works nicely. At some point I will also probably throw it on here, but for now I haven't. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that was that. Um, what I did during my vacation, and apart from that, also of course a lot of reading, a lot of sleeping, mostly sleeping really, uh, working through my YouTube backlog as well. And I think it is raining, which is good because it's way, way, way too dry in Germany right now. Um, I just have to keep my ear on the on the rain intensity because all the windows are open throughout the whole flat here right now so if push comes to shove i have to take a quick break but uh, i hope that won't happen um so uh okay so after my vacation i came back to the usual rather big vacation backlog which thankfully this time consisted less of a ton of issues to wade through, but rather a ton of PRs to review, which is was a really nice change. So huge thanks for that. Um, I, I, I mean, that was still a lot of work that I had to take care of, but it was, I don't know, it, it was more fun work to take care of, I have to say. Like um, having someone who already did a lot of stuff and then just having to look if they did it right and maybe maybe changing some things here and there and discussing things here and there there is certainly nicer compa compared to uh yeah well this is broken and this is broken and this is broken but i'm not going to help you to fix it so more more more, more uh, vacation backlogs like this please versus the the 20 unsolved issues um then uh, one thing that I did uh, last week, I think, if I'm not mistaken, something like August 9th, maybe, uh, I released uh, Octoprint 182 because among the things that uh, ended up in my inbox during my vacation was sadly also uh, one uh, security vulnerability report about something with, I think, low severity. It was low severity. I can't even remember right now what it was. I would actually have to quickly check in the, in the release notes. Um, ah, I think it was an open redirect, right? Another open redirect. Yeah, so something where if someone talks you into um, 
into using a specially prepared URL to log into Octoprint instead of the usual login dialog that Octoprint automatically points you to, then they could make you get redirected to a hostile page, which could make be looked like Octoprint and by that uh, uh, steal your credentials for Octoprint after which they would have to somehow gain access to your Octoprint instance, which hopefully, uh, like recommended, you do not have exposed on the public internet and uh, do not have exposed on a hostile network anyhow. So yeah, the credentials wouldn't really help them with much, but still it was, uh, it was a problem that I wanted to see fixed. And um, also we saw some issues from people installing Octoprint fresh or updating from quite old versions to 1.8, uh, running into an update of Flask or rather an update issue with Flask because Flask um, Octoprint required Flask 2.2 and no 2.2. Yeah, two, something larger than two, but smaller than three. And it turned out that there was a breaking change in 2.2, Flask 2.2. Uh, and so um, that is also something that I solved through a version pin and which in 1.9 will be fixed for good by uh, updating and, and, and migrating code as needed. Um, so that is what I did as well since my return from my vacation. Also something that is not necessarily work related as to far that I did it during my work hours, but rather something that I did in order so I could have work hours during the heat wave here in Germany is that, so I have this AC unit here that you see partially in the background, uh, which is a portable one. And like most of the portable ones, it only has a single hose, which means that it is somewhat inefficient because it um, basically it creates it creates a low pressure zone in the room it is in in that mode of operation because it um, drags room sucks room out of the room and out through the hose into the into the environment. And that means you get a low pressure zone in your room and then the air has to be brought in from somewhere in order to, uh, uh, um, in order to equalize that pressure. And that means you constantly basically suck warm air back into the room, which the AC then has to cool down again and then it gets sucked in back again. And that is a bit stupid. So. Uh, converting it to a dual hoster design means you make it so that it um, no longer sucks the air that it needs for um, for the the, the 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 heat exchange to work, which it then blows outside uh, from from outside uh, from inside, but rather from outside. So you basically turn that into one cycle and have the inside be another cycle. And those cycles are then separated from each other and you no longer generate low pressure, uh, a low pressure in, in a zone in your room. And that is what I did with mine. Uh, and I did this after hours. I did this during the weekend, but uh, still I figured I might as well uh, quickly show you because Octoprint and 3D printing were heavily involved in that as well. And um, yeah, I basically uh, captured all of that in a bit of a Twitter thread. So I found someone with the same uh, AC unit as me um, who had shared a custom backplate in order to, uh, which allowed to, to attach uh, another AC hose to it. So I printed that out, it was two parts. So I had to glue it, uh, epoxy on uh, actually three parts. So one half, the another half and the ring here for the adapter piece for the hose. Then I also had to print the hose adapter as well. And this is how it then ended up. So this is the second hose that is now attached to that. And I also found that I had a leak in that one, which is why it is heavily duct taped, duct, duct taped. And um, I also had to design and build a new adapter plate that I put into my balcony door here onto which I then let the shutter drop. So to seal everything off and such. Um, and I got this plate here off the shelf for, for these things to, to snap into, but then I needed to uh, cut out the right things here and then varnish the whole thing. And this is how it finally looked like after installing everything and um, 
ceiling, putting some ceiling tape on top here and so, and that is really uh, well isolated now. And uh, I then also um, designed these things here in FreeCAD and uh, printed them out, which by the way nearly drove me insane because I had some severe adhesion issues. Um, and they, they are basically just uh, two vent covers that redirect the airflow to opposite sides because this side here is pushing out the warm air and this side here is pulling in the hopefully not so warm air. And now they are at a 90 degree angle basically thanks to these uh, vent slots here and uh, that is hopefully making sure that the very hot air coming out of here doesn't get immediately sucked back in here. A slightly better differentiation uh, or separation would probably be better, but this is the best that I could up, come up with for now with the space also that I have behind here because I cannot just move this over to the left because then I cannot close the door anymore as close as possible to isolate that and not have heat creep come in. Yeah, so that was uh, Operation Make Gina's Office Cooler and just when I finished it, the heat wave stopped. So um, I still cannot tell you how well that dual hose modification worked because the temperature sunk so much that I barely need the AC anymore. It's still a bit hot in here. I'm looking at 31 degrees right now, but uh, Celsius, I should add. Uh, but... Um, at least it is no longer 37 or 40. So um, that is good. Yeah. Okay. And another thing while we are still here is uh, that I did, and that actually was uh, stuff that I did during my work um, uh, work hours because that was something that was on the to-do list for ages now. Um, I don't know if you remember my test rig, which by now has grown a bit to three devices. So three Raspberry Pis that uh, can be switched on and off through this one here, uh, this this other Raspberry Pi 4 here, and this little USB um, hub, powered USB up down here, which I can control and switch, in the, switch the outputs of individually. And that one here also, as you can see here, these three USB cables here, they, they connect to little adapters at the back of these Raspberry Pis here called USB SD Max. And those are basically fake SD cards, or rather, hmm, they are not really fake SD cards because all of them take one SD card, but they multiplex an SD card between a Raspberry Pi where it acts like if you have if, like as if you just had slotted in the SD card into the Pi, or if switched to host mode, they uh, become a USB mass storage device that you can just access like it was a USB stick or something. And this enabled me to be able to uh, to flash um, Octopi, an Octopi, a fresh Octopi image to an SD to 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 a Raspberry Pi. So power it down, flash flash an, an image to it, power it up again, uh, provision stuff as needed, and uh, has sped up my um, release testing tremendously. So I built this in summer of 2020. Uh, I think 143 or something like that was the first one that I um, used this on. And um, it is insane what this thing has saved me in time and frustration since I started using it. And Jim asks is if, it, if it's similar to the SD wire stuff. I don't know how this dwire stuff is implemented. Um, I think though that that might be might not be providing full speed access to the to the SD card when in host mode. I'm not sure though. And here I really get something like 40, 50 MB per second um, <laughs> if the if the reading device can keep up with it. Um, and that means that flashing doesn't take ages. And that was very important to me because there are a lot of solutions out there apparently that allow you to multiplex an SD card, but in a very slow access mode. And that is just out of the question when I'm trying to, first of all, flash it within less than an hour. And also uh, when I want to boot something of it and experience full blown speed, uh, that's also um, important here. And so that really works nicely with these things. The only downside of the SD Max is 100 euros per uh, per unit. So uh, you are looking at something like 400 or 450, maybe 500 if you calculate in the devices and all of that. So maybe a test test rig here that uh, that cost me 500 euros, maybe all in all, with uh, 
yeah, three Raspberry Pis here, one Raspberry Pi 4 with, I think, I think that even is an eight gigabyte unit. Then I also have, you can see one here, I have USB voltage and, uh, uh, and amperage measuring devices in between all of the power connectors, uh, which I track in my local Grafana instance in order to know when anything here is discovering under voltage or such. I, I think I, I, um, I, uh, I demoed that a while back in one of these here actually where you could see that uh, for example a USB webcam takes more power than uh, the Raspberry cam which is not really surprising so you see the the one here that what that one has a USB camera attached a Logitech to C270 and that one here in the back has a Raspberry Pi camera attached and the one in the middle has no camera attached so that I have pretty much yeah the most common camera situations available here no camera, USB cam, and uh, and Pi cam. Anyhow, why am I telling you about this? So uh, that thing set, sits right next to me here, like I'm touching it right now. And um, it's really, really nice for me to be able to test stuff locally and uh, to quickly flash things on there, to quickly provision an SD card uh, image, an Octopi image with uh, Wi-Fi credentials, configuration for Octoprint already on there and stuff, and then um, flash it on there and test if updating to the next Octoprint version works, like something like this. And it is also very helpful to test newly built Octopi images, either through the Octopi um, up-to-date build that uh, I created, which basically takes the old Octopi or the, the latest Octopi image and then uh, updates Octoprint on it and updates the kernel and the bootloader on it and also... Um, due to changes in a Raspberry Pi image and recently started to install also a little a little helper script that automatically adjusts paths and such as needed if you decided to change the name of the default user on your Raspberry Pi image during flashing, which the new Raspberry Pi image uh, allows, but which Octopi does not support out of the box yet. And um, whenever I build one of these, what I need to do is download it first and test it and figure out if it is, if it, if it boots and if everything looks okay on it. And um, that is a bit annoying, always having such a manual step in between. And on the other hand, I have this thing sitting right next to me. So what I finally did is um, I made it so that I can use this from a GitHub action. And that is really nifty. So um, we have here the latest Custopizer uh, built for the Octopi up-to-date image. Custopizer is, by the way, also something that I built uh, uh, last year. So apparently this is something where I do something awesome with it once per year. Um, and so far that only consisted of a build and the deploy step, where the build step is creating the customized image and creating a release for it and attaching the image as an asset to it and 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 then the deploy step basically just was um, sending me a message that I had to manually check that thing and approve the build. And after that, uh, the, the release would be modified slightly so that the next time that the page build runs on octoprint.org, which also provides the, um, the JSON file that the Alpi imager consumes, that it would be included instead of the old one. And I now added this test step here. And what this test step does is it calls another workflow in another project of mine, uh, Octoprint DevTools. And that is the that contains the uh, the automation scripts that I've been using all the time already to control this, this test rig, or rather the flash host, which is the Raspberry Pi 4 that controls all the stuff and, and, and is also the thing that directly can flash stuff. Um, and... Um, this now uh, basically, so first of all, it opens up um, a connection into a Tailscale network in which the flash host is a device as well. And it can only do one single thing in this Tailscale network, which is SSH to um, uh, into, into the flash host with a very specific user. And this very specific user gets a limited shell, which can only, or which, which basically is a wrapper around the, the fabric file that I use for all these automation stuff, so the dev tools, pretty much. 
and then it can uh, execute commands on there like if as if I were using it from here. So uh, what happened here is that when this build here was finished, it triggered this test step with the build result with a link uh, to the to the created image zip file. And this here then, first of all, installed an SSH key connected to the Tailscale network, checked if everything was running. Then it uh, figured out the image to flash uh, and, uh, and downloaded that first on the... I just got a notification that GitHub Actions is experiencing problems, so I'm not sure if I can actually load the logs now. Yeah, I cannot load the log. So you just have to believe me. Uh, it fetched the zip file, then it unpacked the zip file, determined the image, put it on the flash host so that the flash host can flash it, which it then did here. So it flashed the thing. It So it automatically shut down the pie that I told him to flash to, the, the third one in this, in, in this case, the one with the Raspberry Pi camera attached, uh, shut down the pie, um, mounted the SD card uh, on its side, then uh, flashed the image on it, provisioned the image, so put the Wi-Fi credentials on there, gave it a host name, a password, uh, stuff like this. Then, um, then it uh, unmounts it again, powers on the Pi, waits until that is up and pingable. So now we know that the image boots. Um, then it configures Octoprint on it because so it, it, it throws a, a configuration file and, and, and user accounts on there that are standardized and so that no first run wizard will run things like that. And then it is done with, with this stuff here. And then it triggers the next step. And the next step is the end-to-end -end tests that I wrote for Octoprint in like maybe four years ago or started writing. Uh, so it again connects to the Tailscale network, uh, checks out the latest Octoprint version, and then runs the Cypress tests that are in there with a special um, endpoint URL that directs it to a reverse proxy that is running on the flash host, which is the other port that is allowed in the Tailscale network, and which allows the, the uh, Cypress to access the Octoprint instance uh, in its uh, headless browser. And then it runs the end-to-end -end tests in Cypress. So it does stuff like, can I connect to the virtual printer successfully? Yes. Can I disconnect again? Yes. Um, can I log in? Can I log in and set a cookie? As a remember me cookie. Can I log out again? What happens when I log in with wrong credentials? Can I open the settings? Can I close the settings again? Can I close them via the X or by just clicking somewhere in the background? Can I upload a file? I think that was it, but maybe there are, ah, and also is the page loading without any JavaScript errors. So that is the stuff that happens here. And that takes something like less than three minutes running all in all. After that, it also uploads some videos and it's done. And then all of this reports back here to the deploy step or basically triggers the deploy step because this one here waits on this to complete. And then I still get an email that I have to give it a manual thumbs up, but at least I know it already has been tested. I can look at the, at the video of the test if I want to. I know that it could boot. I know that it could uh, log into my network uh, and stuff like that. And speaking about logging into my network uh, via Wi-Fi, um, yeah, that is still something where I need to change things here. So I will change my uh, setup, my... my, my um, uh, my automation stuff so that it no longer goes into my regular network because now something external is accessing that and I do not want to risk anything here so I'm going to throw it into my guest network and that should hopefully work out eh. I'm still listening for the rain but yeah, so that was a huge improvement and uh, that is going to be fun in the future because that now means that, uh, yeah, in principle, there is now a way to do something like a nightly build even that spews out fully tested images and, well, not fully, but very tested images uh, more than, to be honest, I usually did manually. So um, that is really, really nice and uh, it's going to save a lot of time and is also at the same time providing even better tested images in the future in production. So the one that you currently download via the RPI imager, that is already uh, something that was automatically tested here on my test rig at home through the flash host. And that's really nice.
And yeah, so I will still have to streamline some things here and there. Right now, that is the very first version that actually works. But uh, uh, yeah, I was very surprised how fast it actually went with doing this. So first I did it with a custom runner that was running on a, on my in a Docker container on my NAS, but that was a bit slow. And then I figured, hey, why not just limit it to one single network connection or one single network host uh, connection in, in Tailscale or via Tailscale and figured out, hey, there's an official Tailscale GitHub action. Uh, that sounds great. So that also opens up uh, an interesting amount of other kind of, uh, of uh, automation possibilities with regards to collecting data from the um, uh, from the from the ah uh, from the tracking server things like that so that is pretty amazing I'm very happy so far and they Tailscale nicely also offers uh, special discounts for of, of open office uh, open office yeah open source projects and um, so as long as you log in with an GitHub organization then they give you some something like I think five users and uh, yeah, some some higher limits than your usual free account. So that what that is was a really nice surprise. And um, but so far, I, yeah, I can do with two two devices and one ephemeral key. But it's nice. It works. It's beautiful when something like this just works and uh, takes a load off your shoulder. Okay, um, back to me. And uh, Charlie says he had some problems in the last hour with GitHub Actions. Yeah, I. I actually have an automation set up that will automatically um, not only throw the notifications about GitHub status updates on our Discord server, which you might have seen, but uh, the same, the same, the same node red flow basically also pipes it onto my Autrix that is sitting right in front of me. So whenever there is an outage, uh, outage, I, I get some kind of marquee text floating down that that tells me what is currently broken so and the last thing that i saw was github actions and yesterday i think or the day before we had some pull request problems so i don't know but that explains why i cannot access the logs right now and i think that started maybe half an hour ago or maybe more than that so i just hope they will find it soon hack ops and all that and sorry it feels like i have something stuck in my throat um Okay, so what else did I do? Um, or have I been spending my time with? Uh, yeah, so the past couple of days I actually worked on a couple of security fixes that have not yet hit any repositories that you can see, but which will soon go out in shape of 1A3. Nothing horrible, all contained, everything fine, nothing to worry about, especially not if you do run Octoprint the way that you're supposed to run it, as in not port forwarded on the public, hostile, and very, very actively probed internet. So please just do <laughs> and follow the recommendations and the advice. It's meant friendly and not to annoy you. And use a VPN if you need to remotely access your Octoprint instance. That is the safe approach to do that. A port forward is not. It never was, uh, no matter how many uh, vulnerabilities were known or not. And yeah, th so you might be wondering, I mean, the crowd that I'm currently seeing in the chat probably doesn't wonder, but those of you, whoever you, uh, whoever you are watching this might be wondering why this sudden influx in security vulnerabilities in Octoprint, what has happened? Has the quality diminished or something? No. So the thing is, um, so far, First of all, all software has bugs. Some of those bugs are security issues. That is just the inherent nature of software development. Now, um, the goal is always, of course, to find most of these before anyone else does and fix them. But you can always rest assured that every single piece of software that you run has not only the one or other bug, but probably also the all, uh, one or other sec security vulnerability. And that is also why I keep sounding like a broken record about not putting Octoprint on the public internet. Not because I know there's stuff in there, but just because I know how software works and how no matter how diligent you are and no, no matter how careful you are, sometimes mistakes happen and then that can lead to vulnerabilities. And um, 
That is obviously also the case for Octoprint. No matter how much of a good job I do or how matter how much time I invest into making sure that stuff is safe. And that is also something that I've been saying for a decade now, whenever someone puts their instance on the public internet. And um, the thing is, so, so far, no one but me and maybe a handful of Octoprint maintainers actually looked for this stuff. And now there is a new platform on them on the on the horizon basically or not it's not on the horizon it's already there and uh that's called hunter dev and um that is basically a platform where people can report um security vulnerabilities in open source software and if it gets validated by the maintainer they then get some money from the platform not from the project um based on how high the severity of the vulnerability is. So I think anything that is high or critical gets a payout and medium and low apparently doesn't, um, as far as I can judge. And yeah, so um, the problem is, uh, so we got the first vulnerability about that, I think back in March or May, I'm not entirely sure. And um, it was something I think with the medium or maybe it was even a high severity. I can't remember right now. In any case, I fixed it and uh, then pushed the, the the release with it and everything was fine. And uh, I think a CVE was also issued. So like an official security advisory was also issued for that. And that was when the fun started <laughs> because um, that is basically, yeah, you usually can bet on, on, on one thing that once once one security vulnerability is discovered in a project and make, made public through the CVE process, um, people would start hunting, especially if there is a possible bounty to grab. So since then, we have been getting more and more of reports from people on this platform. And remember when I said that you get more money when the severity is higher. Yeah, that also means that everything that we get is usually classified as high or critical, even if it's low. So that has been a lot of work weeding through. And um, it's frankly also a bit frustrating uh, when I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to best describe that, but imagine you the security of, of Octoprint's users is something very dear to my heart. And now imagine what my heart rate does whenever I get an email from this platform. And all I see is just there is a vulnerability and it has roughly this and this, um, uh, how do you say, uh, CWE, um, like it, it, it has this attack vector, basically, this, this kind of vulnerability. And then usually my heart sinks <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm very, very, very worried for a bit until I click on the link and then I see, yeah, well, severity is high. Okay. And then I scroll through the thing and I realize, yeah, okay. So this only works if you can, Let, let's just put it this way. This only works if you somehow get access to the instance, talk someone into making something utterly, utterly stupid, and then also manage to make them give you some outcome from that so no that is just not something that will happen in logical in in reality so but uh this is stuff that that we get reports about and that we have to wade through and that is a bit yeah let's just say it is starting to become a bit of a drain on everyone involved and that is also why i'm taking this proactively to the platform now but um Long story short, the reason for more security updates on Octoprint side now is that even if something ha just has low severity, even if it is something that I find very, very unlikely to ever happen in reality, if there is some problem, then I want to fix it and I want to fix it fast. So instead of waiting for the next maintenance release, I'd rather roll it out immediately. I waited with one low severity vulnerability now first, uh, which is now available on the maintenance branch already and ready for 1.9, but uh, that will also be backported or is already backported to be included in 1.8.3 uh, because, yeah, while it is now public knowledge and again, in order to abuse that, you will need an, you will need an account on an instance. So you already have an account in an instance. So using it to steal an account on an instance is kind of nonsensical and yeah. And you couldn't even steal an account with this because it doesn't work like that anymore. But anyhow, um, 
even though it is a very low severe thing, I decided if I have to push out uh, a security release anyhow because of other stuff that is on the same level of threat, but a bug is a bug, so why not fix it, right? Uh, I will just include it in there as well. So, yeah. Um, so what are the next steps? Uh, I've been talking for 40 minutes now about what I've been up to, which is surprising considering that it felt not like much, but apparently it was much. Um, what are the next steps? So I already said I want to do a bug fix release 1A3 as soon as possible. Uh, will most likely, from the looks of it right now, be a pure security update, but not, not a problem. I mean, that also means it's less likely that uh, some new feature cripples something. Um, probably won't be able to push it out next week, but I'm eyeing the one after that. Um, then there is still a ton of stuff uh, on, the, on the backlog that is tagged for 1.9. 1.9, 1.9, and that is something that I really need to start looking into. I started a bit earlier today, but uh, there is a lot of stuff, and I frankly have not yet had a chance to get my bearings after my return from vacation on what in there still needs doing, what is already in progress in form of PRs or something like that, and what is already done. And uh, then, of course, what I also want to do next and, and finally get around and get, get back to is continue to rebuild the documentation. You remember um, from number 45, I think, uh, this whole project has become very much unsustainable for me long term. So um, the goal is here to reduce my workload, which means I first need to enable more of you to help with it. So the idea is to basically do a huge brain dump and uh, throw everything that is up in here into the docs, uh, especially with terms to architecture, with terms to design decisions, with terms to uh, platform vision and all of that. And uh, for that, however, I'm first switching the docs over to uh, make docs so to to uh, to markdown based instead of the sinks sinks stuff that i was using so far because frankly writing in markdown is way nicer than in sinks and so far the experience has been very nice i just have to get back on migrating things which is a lot of footwork basically because i just have to migrate the the syntax in a lot of source files and a lot of documentation files over from restructured text to markdown which thankfully mostly can just be done with search and replace but some things need a bit more work <coughs> and now i need really need to drink something real quick sorry for that but i'm talking too much okay yeah so that was the next steps very quick and compressed um now we have a quick look at the stats so let me quickly switch you over here and uh yeah so nothing that uh out of the unusual here we are still pretty much stagnated at the whole python 3 adoption thing i fear the last 15 percent will probably never happen but uh, at one point, at some point, I will probably also just stop looking at that because, yeah, I mean, Octoprint is now Python 3. And uh, if people think they want to be stuck on ancient versions, that's their decision, not mine. Um, we have the usual mix here of most, uh, yeah, ha more than half of the instances being uh, offline at any given time, the rest being mostly idle, but uh, steady, yeah. I don't know what that is, 20% maybe, 15% are printing at all times. Um, usual spread across the, the globe. Uh, already around 20k who have updated to 182 within a week. So that is good. I hope that this speed will also uh, be present with 183 then when it gets released. And uh, it also is already the the thing with which the most printed hours are created uh, over the course of the last seven days so uh, the majority of people who actively actually print are using 1a2 for it that's good um then because we had a release let's take a look quickly at how that worked so um 
here is when I pushed out the release, so something around uh, August 9th at half past 12. And then uh, re remember that this here is a log 10 scale, which is why this is very steep, um, because it quickly went from 1 to 10 and then to 1k. And so 1k was already reached at, uh, oh yeah, we went above 1k by, yeah, uh, 2 point, can I calculate, yeah, uh, two and a half hours later. And then uh, it continued and continued and continued and continued. And at the same time, you see the green line, which represents one, like one falling. So beautiful uh, release graph, like I expect it to be nothing out of the unordinary, uh, nothing out of the ordinary. That is, until I looked a bit more closely at what 1.7 is doing here. And I found this very peculiar. And this is why I wanted to share it with you. Because I think what we are seeing here is a commercially used print farm that is offline during the weekends and online during the weekdays, but only from 9 a.m. until um, yeah, 10 p.m. And it consists of roughly, rough, very roughly, something like 60, maybe 70 machines. And that is fascinating. I, of course, I don't know whether those are virtual printers or if those are actual printers. So it could also someone uh, be who, who, who just fires up 70 Docker instances every single day, every single workday to test stuff against. And I know we have at least one or two of those on the Discord server who do things like that. But I, I think I, I still found it very, very funny to see it like this here, because at first I was like, what is this weir weird pattern here until I noticed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, nothing on the weekend, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, nothing on the weekend. And yeah, that's kind of fun. Um, and also, I have no idea right now what was up here. Uh, I remember some issues with the Elasticsearch cluster, so the cluster consisting of one node. So I guess that was probably what caused this, because that might have been on August the 8th, which was a Monday, I think, when I was fighting that stuff. So that would make sense. I, I lost something like a couple hours there, so that would make sense to um, end up in the data like that. I probably should have just restarted Logstash and forgot, but yeah, no matter. Now we just have this small kink in the data where we're going to survive, I think. But yeah, this 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 little 170 bumpy stuff here is really kind of fun. Um, and something where, so if you are watching this and you think this is your print farm, then please raise your hand or get in touch with me on Discord or on Twitter or somewhere else, because I would really love to hear the story behind this pattern. Um, I just love that that I was able to see something like this. And I could now also try to dig in and figure out what instances are that that are vanishing here. But this is something I do not even want to start doing because, no, it, it's not necessary. Just come forth if you want to. And uh, also in private, of course, and yeah, uh, help me get my curiosity into check. But yeah, so that that is really, really kind of fun. And just as a reminder, you can, of course, also always access at least part of this data. And you, you see the the elastic search outage here um, on data.octoprint.org for the past 30 days or for the past seven days. And uh, yeah, you also have the Octoprint version distribution here, the printing stats, Python stats, um, server environment stats, and somewhat recently added, well, recently, maybe two months ago or so, maybe three, um, the the client environment. So what peop what browser do people, what browsers do people use in order to access Octoprint and from what, what operating system do they uh, run these browsers on? Of course, the Raspberry Pi distribution, Octopi version distribution and what firmware do people run? And most people are actually using Marlin, Creality 3D, so the, the Creality 3D Marlin version, which is a bit worrying, but okay. <coughs> oh 
kodiert. Oh, I apologies. No, they are not. Uh, most people are using some version of stock Marlin, then Prusa Marlin, then Creality Marlin. I that was the top ten. This is the overall uh, spread. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Um. So normally I would now uh, switch over to the Q and A segment, but as I said, we do not have any questions in the backlog left. No, nothing was asked uh, before I started this. So if you have any questions, maybe to the stuff that I presented here as well, of course. Uh, now then, just shoot them into the live chat, and otherwise I will just wrap this up. I mean, actually, we only have ten minutes before the church bells start ringing, anyhow, and I'm not making a joke here i have the balcony door open so that will probably be a bit too loud for the recording <laughs> but uh yeah um if you still want to give it a shot now do it and otherwise i will just uh start with my usual wrap-up stuff so the next one of these you know the, the the usual drill in about a month give or take usually more give than take um because it also depends a bit on on on, on other stuff uh, for my uh, on 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 my calendar and, and things, but usually I try to keep it uh, within six weeks of the old one. Uh, oh, Charlie asks, are you planning anything exciting for Octoprint's tenth birthday? Yeah, I actually have thought about this. So far, I've not come up with anything better than a blog post. Um, the thing is also the 10th birthday will be December 25th. <laughs> so that, that is kind of when I actually do not want to work. <laughs> but um, we could celebrate it after, like in January maybe, or maybe we celebrate it before. I don't know. So if anyone has any ideas about what I should do for Octoprint's 10th birthday, then please tell me. Um, uh, just shoot me an email with ideas, get in touch on Discord, on, on social, on the forum, something like this, whatever uh, floats your boat. Uh, because, yeah, I really would love to do something fun for everyone. I just don't really know what, apart from writing about my journey and maybe wrapping up the history a bit and, and, and things like that. I might bake a cake, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, that's not something that the community has anything of from, apart from the immediate community that I know personally that lives here. And yeah, so a, a bunch of friends maybe that use Octoburn, but that's about it that I, anyone else would probably not get a chance uh, to use it. I could maybe, I don't know, I could maybe create a special t-shirt design uh, or something like that and throw it up in the merch shop but uh, or, or sticker or something like that but that's about the only idea that I have right now immediately um, but thankfully we still have something like four months uh, anyhow for that so a bit more actually uh, four months and one week cupcakes to all patrons yeah no that, that is something that I think I cannot afford to do <laughs> um but maybe I'll, I'll 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 think about it a bit more. Yeah, maybe we can find a way for uh, a special T-shirt design in a limited edition that is only going to be available for during the birthday celebration month or something like that. So yeah, so from from December twenty fifth until January twenty fifth or something like that. Um, I think about it and that is also something where I would be really really sure to not try to make too much off of it like minimal kind of level price markup thingy um, just so that people can have something if they want something I don't know um, or yeah, I'll I'll think a bit about it. Maybe also yeah, I'll, I'll also talk to some people. Maybe maybe some 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 uh, some of my friends also have ideas. And again, if you have ideas, please talk to me. <laughs> we can see what we can do. Uh, I'm open to to stuff. Yeah. Um, if that was the only question. Um, which apparently it was, I think. Then I think I'll wrap this up before the church bells start or the, the rain gets horrible and waters my 
whole flat or something like that. And uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for being here. I hope it was interesting and uh, insightful and you learned some stuff about where Octoprint is going and what is happening right now and also what stuff I'm building all around Octoprint that will uh, uh, help maintaining it in one way or the other. I mean, even the AC conversion is something that helps maintaining Octoprint, even if it sounds weird. Uh, as are the e-bike accessories, actually, because a healthy Gina can write better code and biking makes me, keeps me healthy. So, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so um, next one, as I said, in something like four to six weeks. And until then, I hope you have a nice time. Not too hot, not too cold, and uh, you keep you stay stay safe, stay healthy, and all of that, and your filament doesn't tangle, and everything is fine. And until then, happy printing and bye.